Katrina, thank you so much for that. Um, it's been a wonderful start to our day. Um, Katrina will be with us all day, so we will find moments for exchanging. Um, but I think it would be nice to just um, chew and reflect on those things that Katrina has shared. Um, before we proceed with the panels, I'd like to introduce you to Penny Sharman. Uh, she is a published poet, and you'll be able to read some more of her poems in our exhibition installation that is with some questions as well. So if Penny would like to come and I was. I've been a glint in someone's eye, an embryo, a fetus, a howling baby, a toddler, a girl with dreams, a teenager with nightmares, a woman if you like, a rebel, a mother, a bitch, a wife, an adulterer, screwed up mess. A born again that jumps for joy. When you reach a certain age, it's true. Women wear a cloak of invisibility. So who do you see? A wise woman? A crone with all the spells? The meaning of life? Trouble is pockets full of tricksters. It's pot luck which one you pull out next. Could be a wolf or a bowl of cherries. Untitled, I wish I was. Thank you. to introduce Christy G, who is a lecturer in world cinema at the University of Exeter. Um, she's, the, she's the author of uh, a forthcoming monograph, Magic Realism, The Avant-Garde in Exile, around 2018. And she's going to talk about, if these wars could talk, Leonor Carrington's psychospatial movement. Good morning, and thanks very much to Katrina for a great opening keynote. Um, this paper is somewhat experimental in form and has a lot of um, open-ended questions. Um, it's a methodology that I'm working through um, at the moment, so um, I look forward to your questions and comments later. To mark and celebrate a centenary is to celebrate an individual, a presence, an artist, a writer as the originating force behind a series of works, but also in claiming Leonora Carrington's body of work for academic study or reinterpretation, the works themselves are shown to be alchemical nodes in a planet of convergences and sympathies. We celebrate how these works live on and how they continue to ask more of us. Through objective chance, these works speak to the irrational temporality of sensing the world products and catalysts of the sensory imagination. And really this is where the idea for my paper began. 
wondering how my overwhelming effective responses to works like green tea or down below spoke of tactile haptic reception of cultural objects detailed in someone like Vivian Sobchak's work, or the precognitive jolt of affect before it becomes a named emotion. So I've been working through um, ideas on objects and also on sensory perception. And so my relation to Carrington and her work strikes me as being very um, much an experience of sensation and participation, um, a very active experience. So in my paper, I'm going to look, of course, at the house and the room and the tactile relationship between the characters in the writings, but also characters in uh, the paintings and Carrington herself. Um, and I'm also going to think about the sensory disturbances that happen within these rooms, within these spaces, and the objects within them. I'm going to start <coughs> here with um, an idea, really, um, that comes from Francois Lyotard. Art is a cultural object, but the work is not merely a cultural object, although it is that too. It harbors within it an excess, a rapture, a potential of associations that overflows all the determinations of its reception and production. Production. And also the idea from Deleuze and Guattari that a work of art is a bundle of affects. So what both of these quotes give us is an idea of a very vital dynamic um, structure that cannot be contained, which works nicely with the containment of walls and rooms. Okay. So the scenario which started this train of thought for me is um, the work <coughs> Count, um, from Chilean filmmaker and surrealist Alejandro Jodorowsky, his account of Leonora decorating Louis Bunuel's room in Mexico with her own, of course, her own menstrual blood. The story as remembered by Jodorowsky bears considerable similarity to Breton's famous anecdotal reference in Black Humor, in which Carrington meticulously covers her feet with mustard. In this later episode, she exchanges the condiment for her own blood in protest at Bunuel's impersonal and tasteless motel room, to which he had invited her as a potential mis mistress. I must admit that this story thrilled me and made me laugh out loud as I reveled in its sheer lack of social boundaries. But more than my initial instinctive reaction, I was intrigued by the way in which this echoed Carrington's seeming ability to collapse room and body in infinite horizontal and vertical iterations, not only in her painting, but also in her written work. Nurseries, cafes, castles, forest cathedrals, ruins, churches, sanatoriums, closets, beds, drawers, and cabinets populate stories and paintings alike. And other people's anecdotal tales of her in real life often involve her inhabiting and interacting with rooms and objects. As a reader and viewer of her work, I experience, I experience a synesthetic pleasure in the onslaught of tactile text and image, connecting my own memories to the rich and vivid spaces that Carrington offers. And I wondered, what did Carrington's work mean for contemporary studies relating to women's art, the body, haptic, sensory, and affective response, and issues, of course, on mental health and on shame? I begin as a reader, a viewer, with bloody handprints. So as I said, today's paper is an experimental exploration of things, themes such as synesthesia, affect, and reception, as well as the figure of the room self, a figure which I theorize as resolutely female. Carrington's anxiety during and immediately after the First World War involves heightened emotion, paranoia, eating disorder, and what might be considered materially as schizophrenic dislocations of time and space. I feel that the manner in which she articulates her state of being relies upon the sensory apprehension of her surroundings, which often blurs in a synesthetic dynamism involving taste, touch, smell, and sound, as well as sight. Her ability to remember, evidenced in Down Below and Little Francis, for example, is strongly tied to houses and rooms from her childhood home, to the house's embodied canvas at San Martin d'Ardèche, and of course her topographical remembering of the various spaces in and around the sanatorium in Santander. 
It is significant, I think, that Carrington's painting of Cookie Hall has been chosen for the cover of the New York Review of Books republication of Down Below this year, a painting of her fi first house in England where she grew up and whose ghosts haunt every subsequent lodging that she inhabits. And sorry to quote again um, what Katrina has just uh, already quoted for us from The Hearing Trumpet, but I think it's a very significant and pertinent quote from The Hearing Trumpet. Houses are really bodies. We connect ourselves with walls, roofs, and objects just as we hang on to our livers, skeletons, flesh, and bloodstream. Blood and the nervous system connect the flesh and stone in Carrington's work. The concept of a femme maison, to use Louise Bourgeois' terminology, or a room self, or a house self, is a syncretic, sentient entity between female, human, animal, but also nature, architecture, and object. By marking walls with menstrual blood, Carrington enacts this permeability as well as illustrating that domestic femininity and reproduction are creative, not prescriptive. In Down Below, when the narrator describes ceasing menstruation while in Madrid, awaiting the trip to Santander, she notes, I'm transforming my blood into comprehensive energy, an alchemical process whereby the body transcends the house, connecting everything in its orbit to the cosmos. Natalia Lusty frames down below within the, quote, surrealist commitment to expanding forms of knowledge through liminal forms of expression, drawing on hermetic readings of space. But the intermediary presence of the room or the house is as important a feature, I believe, as the cosmos. Oh, okay. In 1958, Gaston Bachelard wrote about the phenomenological understanding of intimate spaces or homes that chimes very clearly with a number of female artists and writers' expression of the house or the room, whether this is related to domesticity, sexual encounters, experiences in asylums or in hospitals, or descriptions of workplaces. In his book, The Poetics of Space, Bachelard posits that the house we inhabit, quote, is our first universe a real cosmos in every sense of the world. word. Sorry. He argues that when humans build shelter, the process is primarily one in which the imagination plays the largest role. Comforting with the illusion of protection, the subject, he says, quote, experiences the house in its reality and in its virtuality by means of thoughts and dreams. Through dreams, the various dwelling places in our lives co-penetrate. In expressing space and our relation to it, he continues, we are never real historians, but closer to poets, in that we struggle to condense the depth of psychological elasticity of an image. As the narrator of Down Below admits, rational terms or words are insufficient to describe the complexities of her physical state as she journeys through real and imagined towns and cities. Despite Bachelard's male narrative voice, his phenomenological reading of intimately inhabited space clearly relates for me to Leonora Carrington's work across every uh, aspect of her work, in fact. Bachelard's topoanalysis privileges the daydream over the dream, a form of symbiosis linking past, present, and future that Carrington also evokes in the forms of visions in Down Below. Quote, this is from Down Below. One night, as I lay awake, dreaming, I had a dream, a bedroom, huge as a theatrical stage, a vaulted ceiling painted to look like, like a sky, all of it very ramshackle, but luxurious. Bachelard defines the formal structure of the house, shelter or room, spatially rather than temporally. As a reader and viewer of Carrington's work, I too experience it phenomenologically, both spatially and bodily. Even though the historical and political particularities of the war, the treatment of mental illness, and the colonial and patriarchal structures of oppression are key components of Down Below, my senses are awakened by the pain and wonder of Carrington's spatial poetics. Down Below is a paradise, the space in which telephones communicate and people are allowed to read and walk around when they are not sick. For Bachelard, the indelible solitude of one's first family home is the memory of the crypt, Jung's cellar of the unconscious. In characteristic Carrington fashion, a bajo or down below is made into a paradise. The unconscious becomes a happy place. 
like a hotel, which from a few passages earlier in the book, we know to be a site of rape and imprisonment. So this is the paradoxical space that time and time again she offers us as readers, a paradise, a hotel, where people talk on the telephone, but also a hotel echoes with reverberations of the horrors that took place um, in Madrid earlier. Rooms are paradoxically and ambivalently situated throughout her journey, taking on aspects of her own self as it shifts perspective. In the summer of 1892, Charlotte Perkins Gilman wrote her autobiographical short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, while under house arrest. In the account, Gilman surface suffers from a nervous disposition and a slight hysterical tendency, and in order to recover, she is forbidden to write by her physician husband, John. Significantly, the way in which she describes the room to which she is eventually banished bears strong similarity to that of Down Below and other tales in Carrington's Earth. The room in the yellow wallpaper used to be a nursery, with the windows barred, the floorboards gouged and splintered, and is set within the large house and gardens of what Gilmore, Gilman terms a colonial mansion or haunted house. As time passes, she becomes obsessed, as I'm sure you all know, with the revolting sickly yellow wallpaper in the room, peeling off in patches. It is dull enough to confuse the eye in following, she says, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study. The wallpaper takes hold in her psyche as she exclaims, I never saw so much expression in an inanimate thing before. What transpires in this story of mental illness is a fusion of the senses in Gilmore, Gilman, sorry, narrator, um, as she finds it increasingly difficult to separate the optic horror of the wallpapered room from her own perception of being, with the dramatic denouement finding her herself surreally becoming at one with the wallpaper and its creeping phantasms. Similarly, in Down Below, the narrator describes how, quote, the room was painted with silvery pine trees on a red background, a prey to the most complete panic I saw pine trees in the snow. Occurring in the narrative after a third dose of cardiazole and following a series of convulsions, complete panic here is fused with the experience of the walls coming alive. In both of these texts, the writer is unable to tear herself from the optic horror and becomes at one with it. However, it is in their respective senses of self where these two female writers differ. Perkins Gilman articulates the shame which her husband, doctor, feels at her behavior and her own embarrassment at being unable to meet his demand. Whereas Carrington defiantly takes both hands and crafts a meaningful and tactile practice that is without shame. In fact, whenever she feels a strong emotion, the narrator of Down Below tries to expel it, usually personified from her body, like when she tries to expel Elizabeth by recreating her as an almost Ikebana um, type flower arrangement on um, a collection of furniture. In making this object, this strange sculpture, she expels the idea from herself. So this leads me to talk to the second aspect of my exploration, which is objects or things, what Jane Bennett calls vibrant matter. In Jane Bennett's words, articulated in Carrington's, um, articulated in Carrington's story, Little Francis, um, material and sensorial boundaries are collapsed. In her book, Vibrant Matter, Jane Bennett talks about objects appearing as things. And there's a difference between an object and a thing. And a thing has its own vitality, its own essence, but its own ability to um, interact with everything around it. Um, it's not reducible to the context in which human subjects set them. And I think this is a really important connection with Carrington, because the objects that I find um, most intriguing within her stories and paintings are the objects that refuse to um, adhere to any sense of order. These are vibrant matter. Um, Jane Bennett comes across the idea of vibrant matter when she herself is walking to the subway and she sees a collection of detritus um, and it catches her eye and to her these objects have their own order. They have their own story, their own vitality that is outside of human contact. And um, this is the link that I'm hoping to explore more with Carrington's work, how the objects function and how they form some kind of correspondence within these spaces 
these houses, rooms, shelters um, that characters inhabit. Okay, so objects like houses and rooms act autonomously, we could say, extensions of human thought and form. The journey described in Little Francis to many extents mirrors that of Juan Montezuma's The Mansion of Madness, for which um, Leonora was artistic director. Little Francis is an autobiographical fairy tale which has been discussed by Carrington scholars in tandem with the period in which Max and Leonora lived in France. And this is <coughs> of course, to down below. Although not yet tied to four walls or four bedposts, the titular Little Francis Carrington nevertheless requires objects and natural edifices, rocks, monumental plants, and mountains to express interior thought. In fact, every object, just like in the Mansion of Madness, is significant, and as Brian Masumi has put it, charged with force encounters, the kind of vibrant matter that never sits still. In Pierre Mabie's influential book on myth, Mirror of the Marvelous, he writes, quote, during the adventure, the smallest sign along the way, a lost shoe, a lock of hair, the gift of a ring, serve the same purpose as prophecies. They are the indications or signals to help us interpret our fate. Like Jane Bennett and the vibrant matter on her way to work, Mabi apportions agency to things. The reader might wonder, for example, why Carrington leaves in the sentence in Little Francis, ancient scrap iron of unknown origin lay in the dust sentence kind of hangs there, doing nothing. It lodges like a found object in our consciousness, dry to the touch. In contrast, the anthropomorphic Miralda locks is an animated plant that has grown from human hair and makes Francis real upon smelling it, complaining, what a heavy smell. The hair later becomes rolling tobacco before changing back into human form. In another vivid sequence, Francis' voice trembles with so much emotion that it materializes and grows hands so as to grab a leaf. Again, the leap that the reader must perform in keeping up with these disobedient objects requires the ability to confuse the senses, to touch sound and taste color, smell transformation <coughs> of matter. Francis, too, is transported back into his childhood home through the smell of sandalwood and cider. In Down Below, the narrator takes her first steps in Andorra in a pact with the mountain and its animals that was accomplished through the skin, quote, accomplished through the skin, by means of a sort of touch language. Both of these texts present tunnels, perhaps labyrinthine paths of correspondences that require further correspondence. And I'll finish here. Um, in 2003, Marsha McKimmon wrote that the intellectual challenge presented by women's art practice is to mobilize radical difference and think otherwise. Every intervention into this subject is strategic, exhilarating, and dangerous, changing both what we know and how we know. Leonora Carrington's work has always led me to think otherwise, and this is because I admire her absolute refusal to cover herself her humanness or her spiritual self, but instead, instead to set it free to lick and scratch at the walls that bind the social female. Her work is detailed, painstaking, yet also messy, spontaneous, and repetitive. There is no success or failure, no real fear or coyness. Thank you. and an MLIT at the University of Turin with a dissertation entitled The Clothed Hyena, Bertha Mason, Madness and Women's Writing. And um, more recently, she's been at the University of Glasgow where she started researching on feminist theory, creativity, self-narrative and mental illness. 
So her project is entitled Mental Illness and Female Creativity in the 20th Century, a comparative study of Leonora Carrington, Alda Marini, and Anne Charlotte Robertson. Extremely interesting comparisons there. And um, she's, her title is I Must Live Through That Experience All Over Again, Leonora Carrington's Narrative of Trauma and Hospitalization. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, is it working? Okay, perfect, thank you. So I'm very pleased to be, okay, speaking, okay, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and to share the room with people who are as enthusiastic on this topic as I am. And I will just jump straight into the paper because I'm really bad with timing, so maybe we can talk about it later. So today I will analyze the ways in which Carrington presents a contrasting and often paradoxical perception of the space of the asylum in Down Below, the memoir that is dedicated to her mental breakdown and hospitalization. The complex relationship that Carrington establishes with the hospital results in an ambivalent representation of the place as either a hellish place of torture or a heavenly site of redemption. In both cases, Carrington considers the asylum as a, and their experience of hospitalization um, as something that occurred into another place. My aim is to demonstrate how this representation is influenced by the following factors. So first of all, the fact that the asylum constitutes a known place, as shown by Foucault in his work on heterotopias. Secondly, by the fact that Carrington transforms this space into a liminal space, which is by definition a symbolic space characterized by contradictions and challenges. Lastly, it is important to keep in mind that when Carrington was writing down below, she had just been affected by a series of traumatic experiences that had changed her life and that clearly influenced her writing. So by pre presenting these direct extracts from the texts, I will also demonstrate how down below offers new insight into the situation of women who were hospitalized in European psychiatric hospitals in the 20th century. So, before moving on to presenting past direct passages from down below, it is important to attempt to give a brief definition of space and place. And I've got a slide here. Um, so, in space and place, the perspective of experience, I foot one suggests that these two concepts are codependent and that in human experience they often coincide. Nevertheless, he later specifies that the idea of space is more abstract than place, and that from the security and stability of place, we are aware of the openness, freedom and threat of space. And according to Tuan's reading, while place represents experience, values and security, space is characterized by traits that are closer to feelings of unknown and threat. Similarly, Priestel and Meskel echo this approach and conclude that while space simply constitutes a non-specific physical location, place is formed by the value that we attribute to that space as human beings and because of our human interactions. So if we apply these definitions to Carrington's text, it appears evident how the boundaries between space and place are blurred. It is not quite clear whether she relates to the asylum as a humanized space of torture and as a space that cannot become place because of the lack of humanity and of sense of belonging, or if she sees it as place because, as we saw already, she charges it with um, spiritual and sacred meanings. However, what emerges most clearly is that Carrington conceives of the asylum as a different dimension. So, when she was interviewed by Marina Barner, she revealed that after the Sorry, after the experience of Down Below, I changed dramatically. It was very much like having been dead. I entered the catatonic state and I was no longer suffering in an ordinary human dimension. I was in another place. It was something quite different, quite different. Carrington admits that her days in Spain changed her life. She describes her experience as both catatonic and near death and she chooses the Santander Asylum as the location of her catharsis, transforming it from a place of incarceration into a place of freedom. 
For the artist, that summer of 1940 represents something that transcends the human and cannot be analyzed using logical categorizations, as many other things in her life, I would say. The only method that Carrington deems effective to interpret her journey is through a symbolist and surrealist reading, um, remaining faithful to the Kiriko statement that one must picture anything in the world as an enigma, end of quote. It was a quote. So finally, writing down below provides Carrington with the opportunity to engage a posteriori with their liminal experience in order to fully grasp its meaning and attributes to it non-linear ideas of symbol on symbolic spaces, ideas that have always fascinated her. So mapping, renaming, symbolizing the space and understanding its metaphysics are essential practices in Carrington's deconstruction and reconstruction of her journey into madness. And she works with them throughout the whole narration. After having described their arrival at Villa Covadonga, the Santander Asylum, the author recreates her sense of displacement, displacement at waking up in a completely unfamiliar place, surrounded by strangers. So now here I have <laughs> one and two images that I managed to find, as you can see from a YouTube video of a documentary on uh, Leonora's life that was uh, screened on Canal 11, a uh, Mexican cultural uh, channel, TV channel. Uh, so obviously I, I didn't have the chance to go there and I'm really, really looking forward to talking about uh, if there is actual documentation of this place because uh, I would like to gather more, inf even visual information uh, and photos of, of that. So surely Gabrielle or Joanna after will help with that. So Lenora makes clear how important it was at that point to understand where she was, to identify the place. She writes, quote, I tried to understand where I was and why I was there. Was it a hospital or a concentration camp? At this stage, Carrington is trying to rationali rationalize what is happening around her. This attempt to create a logical understanding of place is characteristic of the first days of her hospitalization and will later lead to the symbolic and surrealist representation of the asylum that I mentioned before. Carrington describes her awakening in Covadonga as painful, a side effect of the potent sedative that she had been injected with. When she wakes up, her hands and feet are tied to leather straps, and um, an unfriendly looking nurse is watching on her in, quoting, a tiny room with no windows on the outside. Carrington describes that room in a remarkable detail, as a demonstration that mapping out the space is the only way she, that she has to comprehend what is happening. Later, her panic worsens as she's not given a clear explanation by the nurse. Again, she tries, she tries to regain control over the situation by making logical assumptions and by see seeking to better know the place she's in. So she asks to be taken out in the garden so that she can have a look at the surroundings. At this point, she tells herself, I probably was still in Spain. The vegetation was European. The architecture of Covadonga rather Spanish. So unfortunately, this attempt to guess her location proves again unsuccessful, as what she is experiencing does not match anything that she has seen before, and none of her assumptions make sense to her. Carrington is therefore forced to abandon these deductions in favor of the following conclusion. And this is the painting she painted after, just before writing down below the memoir. I ended up believing that I was in another world another epoch, another civilization, perhaps on another planet, containing the past and the future, and simultaneously the present. This description supports the theory presented above, according to which the Santander Clinic is neither a space nor a place for Carrington, but it is something other than itself, which cannot be apprehended in either space or in time, and that transcends any human and rational explanation. The idea that the psychiatric hospital is a known place, as I said before, is supported by Foucault's theorization of heterotopias. In Of Other Spaces, he writes that the heterotopia is, quote, a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites that can be, find, be found within a culture are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. 
This representation and inversion of sites seem to be in line with Carrington's perception of the asylum. In addition, the disrupted way she experiences time, also typical of trauma writing, mirrors one of the principles of heterotopias, in which Foucault writes that, quote, the heterotopia begins to function at a full capacity when men arrive at sort of absolute break with their traditional time. In the section that follows her description of the first days at, at Covadonga, Carrington explains how her terrible nostalgia and desire to run away led her to attribute symbolic meanings to one specific pavilion, which becomes the embodiment of liberation, as we saw before. I had heard about several pavilions. The largest one was very luxurious, like a hotel, with telephones and unbarred windows. It was called Abajo, down below, and people lived there very happily. To reach that paradise, it was necessary to resort to mysterious means, which I believed were the divination of the old truth. The conversion of down below into a liminal space, which will be the setting of Carrington's death and rebirth, is at this point fully realized. From now on, everything that happens to her will, interpret, will be interpreted in relation to how close she is to having access to this pavilion. The most difficult challenge in this quest is, without a doubt, the cardisol treatment. The three injections that she is given seem, in fact, to split the narration in three stages, like three stages of ascent. After describing the first session, Carrington writes, I believe that I was being put through put through purifying torture so that I might attain absolute knowledge. I knew that Christ was dead and done for, and that I had to take his place. I was Christ, Christ on earth, which is by far my favorite part of the story. So by utilizing Christian imagery, Carrington proclaims herself savior of the world. She is the new Christ, a female Christ on earth, and she is ready to sacrifice herself for a bigger purpose. As Carol P. Christ writes, the symbol of the goddess is especially necessary to surrealist women artists as a way to counteract the overpowering presence of their fellow male artists. The cardisol that Carrington is given performs the same function as traditional healing drugs used by indigenous cultures in ceremonies of passage. And by leaving this martyrdom, Carrington is ready to become, as she writes, the third person of the Trinity, and is clearly advancing in her journey towards down below. At this point in the narration, Carrington has fully entered the liminal space. She has crossed the threshold that will guide her to her post-liminal self, who, as she writes, will possess absolute knowledge and have access to the old truth. According to Carrington's Christian mythologization of space of the hospital, she writes, the pavilion with this name, down below, was for me the earth, the real world, paradise, Eden, and Jerusalem. Down below becomes the heterotopia par excellence, a utopic site that contains within itself all the worlds, either, either real or divine, that the author associates with freedom and salvation, in contrast with the infernal nature of the other pavilions of the asylum. Carrington concludes that down below correspond particularly to Jerusalem, and after the second injection of cardiazole, she pronounces the following words to the nurse. Dress me, I must go to Jerusalem to tell them what I've learned. It's amazing. <laughs> this last statement can be used to confirm the importance of orality and storytelling, as well as myth, religion, and spirituality in overcoming trauma which I argue is the main reason that pushed Carrington to write this memoir. Even after losing the manuscript, as many of you will know, the artist feels the need to redictate it orally from scratch in a process that recalls that of talking therapy. What I intend to underline with this paper and with my further studies is that down below, apart from representing a brilliant and experimental surrealist work of art, constitutes first and foremost the testament of a lived experience of violence and abuse. While Carrington is experiencing the dark days narrated in Down Below, 
she constantly tries to understand the place in which she is incarcerated, at time interpreting a space and approaching it in a paradoxical way. However, as I have shown in this paper, thanks to the reflective process that her autobiographical writing initiates, she is ultimately able to escape this, this space and to transcend it. Thank you. Now we have Andrea Gremlin. Um, Andrea is from the Goethe Universität Frankfurt am Main in Germany. Her current research focuses on the transnational interconnections of surrealism in Africa, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And She's going to talk today about lucid madness as method, surrealist style in Leonora Carrington's Down Below. Um, thank you, Alisa, for this presentation. And um, I would also like to thank the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to present my ideas on lucid madness as a surrealist style in Leonora Carrington's Down Below. The analysis of her testimonial diary, an account of her experience in a psychiatric hospital in Spain, where she was referred to in August 1940 due to a nervous breakdown, is part of my current research project on transnational surrealism. Considering her movements between England, France, the US and Mexico, Carrington can be described in Alice Gambrell's sense as an intellectual in transit. Furthermore, because of its traveling quality, her work can be categorized in Ottmar Etter's sense as literature as well as art without fixed abode. As she writes and paints artworks that belong to various geographies, languages, and cultures. This holds especially true for Down Below, which first appeared in 1944 in the New York-based surrealist journal VVV as a translation into English from a French manuscript. As an editorial note tells us, the text is based on an oral account transcribed by Jeanne Magnan, the wife of the French psychoanalyst Pierre Mabille, and translated into English by the Peruvian author Victor Jona. This paratextual information is bewildering. Given the fact that English is Carrington's mother tongue, why should a Latin American writer translate the manuscript from French into English? And how did the original manuscript get lost? The text circulation does not only demonstrate the place of Carrington's work within a transatlantic network, its mystery, as indicated by the editor's note, also unsettles the reality of Down Below as an authentic account written by Leonora Carrington in form of a diary. This performative play corresponds to another surrealist practice in Down Below, the destabilization of the realistic setting by a phantasmagorical and psychotic reality perception. Drawing attention to Carrington's writing strategies, I would like to show how she binds lucidity and madness inseparably together and thus creates her own method of surrealist style, that of lucid madness. This method contest, contests surrealist techniques such as uh, Breton's automatic writing or Salvador, Salvador Dali's paranoia critical method, which seek to activate the unconscious in order to explore new forms of artistic expression. 
I would like to discuss in how far Carrington's writing strategies challenge Breton's method of evading the censorship of rationality, as well as Dali's insistence on a critical agency channeling, channeling paranoia creativity. Furthermore, I would like to analyze the, their effect on the reader, who Carrington enmeshes in a disorienting play which reverses the notion of lucidity and that of reality. Down Below is often read as a response to André Breton's Nadia. His novel reflects the surrealist's fascination for other modes of perceiving and discovering reality, as it explores the main figure Nadia's madness as an object of desire. Here we go. <laughs> uh, the difference between Breton's novel and Carrington's diary is that Nadia talks about madness, whereas down below is written with madness. In his anthology of black humor, Breton always, almost envies Carrington for her authentic experience of madness and romanticizes her as a surrealist hero heroine, a beautiful young witch who, from her delusional adventure onwards, will be able to travel deliberately into both directions, lucidity and madness. Carrington ironically responds to Breton's ide idealization of beautiful madness in a letter directed to her editor Henri Parisot, which is published as a preamble to the 1973 French reprint of Down Below, En Bas. In the short text, full of grammatical and typographic mistakes, Carrington announces that she has grown up and changed so that she cannot be, I cite, petrified in a use that does not exist anymore. She further underlines her advanced age in the final sentence written in capital letters. I does not have one tooth more. Je n'ai plus une seule dent. This is my translation. Her self-ironic remarks on her deficient French and her vanished youth reveal a playful gesture regarding the male surrealist celebration of the femme enfant, the child, woman, as a muse. In the same ironic fashion, she blurs the lines between lucidity and madness as she represents herself as a mature but nevertheless deranged and toothless old lady. The letter thus anticipates the destabilization of lucidity and madness in Down Below, and it does so by writing strategies that consistently subvert the reader's expectation, expectation sorry, of facing a reliable text on the author's experience in a psychiatric hospital. Down Below's intimate and testimonial character is ah okay i skipped over this down below is intimate and testimonial character is above all created by the diaristic characteristics of the text however carrington writes down below three years after her internment which is explicitly stated in the first sentence of the diary Thus, the experience is reconstructed and interpreted by the author and not spontaneously written down in situ. The French edition, the, in the French edition, the first date indicated confirms the year in which Carrington started to compose the text, the 23rd of August 1943. This information undermines the generic convention of the diary in which the date would coincide with the co occurrences as lived and not as remembered. In VVV, the year is not mentioned in the first entry. Anyhow, in both editions, there are two entries on August 26th. The first one designates this date as a Thursday, the second one as a Friday. These temporal confusions correspond to the spatial disorientation uh, created by the text. The magical, fantastical underworld of Down Below overlaps with the realistic setting of the psychiatric hospital, as Carrington's drawing of the hospital's map illustrates. 
the surrealist writer constantly transgresses and reinvents time and spatial settings by fantastical transfigurations, as Ella Moody argues. Thus, pavilions of the hospital are transformed into other geographies, such as Africa, Kovadonga, or Amitshu. These imaginary resettings stand in contrast tr to the narrative com commentaries that suggest a verifiable testimony. The second entry, for example, opens with the sentence, I am afraid I am going to drift into fiction for lack of some details which, cannot, which I cannot conjure up today. The testimonial style of, the pas of this passage seduces the reader to believe in the factual truthfulness of the recounted experience. By means of surrealist techniques, however, Carrington inscribes phantasmagorias and delusional outgrowth into her, her supposedly realistic biographical account. Reality is thus constantly overruled by the imagination that Carrington fuels with her psychotic experience. Her altered perception of reality questions the border between lucidity and madness. In Madness and Civilization, Michel Foucault demonstrates how madness became pathologized in modern European societies in order to exclude all those who could threaten the normality of societal order. We can see this idea reflected in Down Below when Carrington presents her political theory to the British consul. According to her delusion, Hitler and his allies, such as uh, the mysterious figure van Gent, who she considers a double of her dominant father, provoked the Second World War by mass hypnotization. Her political mission consists in breaking the spell so that the war can be ended and the world liberated. I therefore called the British Embassy and saw the consul there. I endeavoured to convince him that the Second World War was being waged hypnotically by a group of people, Hitler and company. That good British, British bourgeois perceived at once that I was mad and found a physician, Martinez Alonso by name, who agreed with him completely after he had been informed on my political theory. In this passage, Carrington clearly exposes the rational position of the consul and the doctor representing the bourgeois society she resented most. In the light of Hitler's propagandistic mobilization of the masses, her theory doesn't even seem so far-fetched. But from the rational and male perspective, it is unacceptable and insane and eventually leads to her confinement in the asylum. Carrington thus calls attention to the exclusionist function of rationality and involves the reader in a reflection on the exchangeability of the antipodes, madness and lucidity. By writing with the disorienti disoriented and disorienting perspective of madness, Carrington challenges our understanding of lucidity even further. In the logic of the imaginary cosmos she creates inside the terrifying and controlling space of the hospital, she believes that by incorporating different personalities, such as mythical and biblical figures, she can liberate herself, the persecuted Jews and the world. I thought that I, a Celtic and Saxon Arian was undergoing my sufferings to avenge the Jews for the persecutions they were being subjected to. Later, with full lucidity, I would go down below as the third person of Trinity. I felt that, through the agency of the sun, I was an androgen, the moon, the Holy Ghost, a gypsy, an acrobat, Leonora Carrington, and a woman. I was also destined to be, later, Elizabeth of England. This enumeration could also originate from one of Carrington's paintings, populated in surrealist fashion by fantastic, divine and real creatures. 
What Carrington presents here as fully lucid, the future entry into her imagined paradise down below, can also be seen as evidence of her paranoiac schizophrenia. Later on, she experiences another moment of lucidity. It comes to her mind that she has to separate herself from the personalities that inhabit her. This awareness triggers the reader's expectation that Carrington returns to reality, but quite the contrary. Play, playing with an ironic reversal of lucidity, she announces her detachment only from Queen Elizabeth, whom she externalizing by recreating her dummy with the furniture of her room, table, chair and vase. The commentary, I had to get rid of everything my illness had brought to me, exemplifies the ambiguity that the writing strategy of lucid madness inscribes, ins inscribes into the text. For the reader, it is impossible to distinguish between the lucidity of her interpretative moments and her delir delirious interpretations of reality. Hence, lucid madness as a surrealist method does not lead to an arbitrary unconscious composition as proposed by Breton's automatic writing, neither does it create a critical agency that controls paranoia creativity as Salvador Dali suggests. Instead, it encompasses, and it encompasses a destabilizing play that consistently dissolves and resets the border between reality and irrationality, awareness and the unconscious. Some scholars classify the ending of Down Below as Carrington's recovery that leads her back to reality. In the moment she awakes from her third treatment of Cardia Soul, she regains her lucidity. All the objects around her, previously charged with magical qualities, now seem useless and stupid to her. Further on, she realizes that Cardia's soul was a simple injection and not an effect of hypnotism, that Don Luis was not a sorcerer but a scoundrel, that Covadonga, Egypt, Amachu, China were pavilions for the care of the insane. However, isn't this resolution conveyed to her from the isn't this resolution conveyed to her from the other side of reality by the mysterious figure Echevarria who seems to emerge directly from a fairy tale? I wonder whether this disoccultizing of the mystery remains more ambiguous if we read it through the lens of lucid madness. Madness and lucidity may have become inseparable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, all three speakers, for sticking to time so beautifully. Um, now we have a chance for a few questions. Anyone got any question for any of the speakers? Okay. Yes. I see a hand up there. I can see a hand at the back waving in the darkness. <laughs> okay. You speak up and then I'll repeat the question. Okay. This picture on the right, was that a, um, a visual interpretation of what, of what she considered her lucid madness? Was that done while she was in the asylum or said, was it done later? So the question is, was the picture on the right a representation of her madness? Was it done then or was it done mm. afterwards? Uh, no, um, this is a picture that was created later. Actually, this was my um, as association because with the two um, eyes that you see there, Carrington consistently talks of her uh, uh, macroscopic and microscopic perspective. Mm. And, and also all this, um, yeah, this is why I chose um, this 
painting just to illustrate my argument. So this is, there's no concrete um, uh, connection. So, yeah. Anna, yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, could you say a bit more about how um, the model you're talking about, the magnet, and carrying two tanks fits in with our chemical belief? So the, that's the question about Lucy's madness and yeah. Carrington's alchemical belief. Yeah, because a lot of the images you're showing are yeah. uh, packed with yeah. alchemical belief. Yeah. This is a very good uh, and important question, I believe. Because um, there's like some scholars argue that this all this um, uh, co cosmic beliefs that um, down below narrates is just like um, a, a whole different um, yeah, uh, philosophy. Um, there's a, um, a French scholar, um, uh, what's her name, I'm sorry, I will um, catch up. Chenieu? Um, uh, 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 Chenieu uh, Gendron, voilà. Mm -hmm. um, and she says that there's even, like, uh, that Carrie uh, creates her own um, philosophy, uh, alchemical philosophy in this text. Um, this, and this is somehow the other world of this confining space of the hospital and the, the trauma um, caused by, by, by the treatment of Cardia Sol. Um, and I think, yes, right, uh, that you could juxtapose those two worlds, right? This almost philosophical um, sketch of, an, yeah. of a belief. Yeah. But I'm thinking perhaps in her work more generally and later work in yeah. Mexico, how she developed our chemical symbolism. What I'm thinking of is the elusive madness idea, being attracted towards systems, plural, that were very, very structured, highly structured, not called systems, they were very, very highly structured. Yeah. And how that fits in with the altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. that she was having exactly. by embracing. Yeah, but exactly. she was drawn towards a very, very systemic uh, method yeah. with, with the alchemical mm -hmm. and the occultism. Yeah. Very highly um, disciplined and structured, but at the same time extremely uh, concerned with exploring aesthetic states of consciousness. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree with you, except I would argue that um, the, line is, the line between structure and chaos, between orientation and disorientations, mm. are so blurred. Mm. So Felicity, you're nodding. So would you like to come in here to talk about structure and alchemy? <laughs> we don't have to, but... Uh, no, it's interesting. I mean, I think these are questions that scholars ask about religion and beliefs and ex artistic expression anyway. Um, there's a lot to be said. There. I don't know, um, yeah. <laughs> but definitely the, the idea of chaos and structure is something that spins um, and gives gives the work a dynamism. That they can. Yeah. yeah, I think it's all an alchemical process that is going on that she's doing with Don Below. While she's writing, she's basically transforming as the alchemy, as the alchemist, this experience from nothing to gold because it's going to be a more spiritual mm -hmm. experience. So. Per se, I think the writing with Down Below is very structured and it's also performative because while she does it, she basically processes her experience and she decides what that represents to her life, to her future art. So I think there is an alchemical <laughs> something. Question here. I was just going to add that if, uh, if you look at the way when it is written, it, it follows, at least structurally, the, the phases of the process of alchemy. So there's a negative process where everything is blended together. Is when she's uh, tied and the, as she's cleaning uh, herself, as she's covered with her own uh, dirt. And then there is the ablatio, is when she's taken to the sun room and she sees the light and it's just a compact in the uh, in a process. And then finally the separatio, where she finally finds, it's like uh, Alessia was saying, the text is a structure as an alchemical text. Mm -hmm. so, so the text itself is an alchemical structure. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. One, more, one more question up here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a comparative yeah, interlude, yeah. That her inner state was going to become the world, and as, black, as the wars were coming alive. And so it kind of came to my mind because I studied the Medius Battle, mm. how like the wars as mimetismo and some paintings of, of, of battle yeah. actually kind of bring um, this idea of the wars coming alive yes. and the ladies sitting in the chair. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's just too much to say in 15 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's a real <laughs> yeah. kind of like house, walls, objects, um, but absolutely, and yeah, I think Farrow's work is completely, um, can also be explored in this way, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much to all those speakers. These conversations will continue. Now we have Penny again. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll take a break now for refreshments, oh, well, so, so that we can yeah, set up for the second poem, and the dance performance Imaginarium, which will take place here. So we've just got to move the furniture around. Okay. So we're flipping the schedule a little bit, and there's refreshments available outside, and we're back in here at 11.15. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.